Okay, so we're in part one, chapter five, paragraph five. Um, I'm starting with a short footnote of what we said yesterday, and then today Ramchal opens up the problem of evil in certain respects, which we need to talk about in, in some detail. There's a lot of deep material here. Yesterday we said that the world is arranged that at the top there are certain uh, energies that God put in the world, and then those energies um, develop th things below them, which, which they are responsible for, and those things below them are both spiritual and physical, uh, and human beings that are a combination of spiritual and physical, and shading that are in between the two categories. All of this is a top-down uh, chain of influence, and everything that happens below is something that's determined by what the situation is above, except for man's free will. Man's free will is independent of the causality of the chain. When a person exercises free will, he causes something to happen. The causation comes from him. Then we said that with his free will, a human being can um, move some other item uh, on his own level. And since everything is connected to the chain of energy and influences coming down, if you move something down here, it's connected to the chain, it can uh, cause disturbances in the chain or changes in the chain. So you can indirect, indirectly affect elements of the chain above your own level using your free will. Then I said there are ways that God decreed for people to be able to, to affect higher elements in the chain, not through moving their bodies. That's not going to do it, typically. But, uh, but they can uh, affect higher elements. And then, by affecting them, there will be, be consequences of that on all the things for which those higher forces are responsible, that they direct them, and so forth and so on. And this includes man's speech and man's thought. Here, it says already totally beyond anything we know in the physical world. At least when we, what we spoke about yesterday, if I take a cup with wine in it and I make kiddish on it, or if I lend money to someone, I hand him money, so I'm moving things in the physical world, and because they're connected to other things, they can have effects. But when I, when I speak or when I think something, that that should have an effect on anything at all is not part of the not part of the natural world at all. This yet it's still some an element in the way in which God set up the world to function. Now, yeah. So, so to some extent, this would be like the, the idea of the butterfly effect. Like the what? Sorry. The butterfly effect. Butterfly. The butterfly effect. Oh no, the butterfly effect. No. <laughs> The butterfly effect uh, is, is this. This is what's called chaos theory, which is a terrible name because it's, it's really not chaotic at all. Um, roughly, you can have two different types of systems in the physical world. One system where when you interact with it, the stronger your interaction, the stronger the, the effect on the system. The less you interact, the less energy you put into the interaction, the less effect you'll have on the system. There are other systems that aren't like that at all. There are systems where if you interact with it one way, you get one result, and if you change the interaction by the slightest amount, the change could be gigantic. This is not mysterious. There's no hidden, something hidden here. We understand these systems very well, and we know exactly why this happens. And both systems are completely deterministic. So I'll give an example. You're pushing a kid on a swing. He's swinging. If you give him a push, he'll go a certain distance. If you give him a slightly stronger push, he'll go slightly farther. Slightly less strong push, he'll go, go slightly less. The outcome of your interaction depends upon the amount of energy. More energy, bigger effect. Less energy, less. And it's, it's proportional. On the other hand, let's say you have a billiards table. So now there are various balls on the table. You have a stick. You hit the white ball to hit another ball to get certain effects, right? Imagine you aim the this, this stick at the ball at a particular angle. 
If you hit it, you're going to get a certain effect. The balls will move around in certain ways. It could be that if you change your angle of the stick to hit the ball by the slightest amount, it will change the outcome drastically. Drastically. Even though the slightest amount. Because, let's say, at a given angle, when you hit the white ball, it halfway down the table, it hits another ball. That ball bounces off, hits another ball, and the balls all move around. Whereas, if you change your angle of the stick a tiny bit, when it gets halfway down the table, it misses that ball, goes into a pocket. It doesn't hit any balls, and none of the balls move. None of them stay exactly where they were, completely stationary. So by changing the angle of the stick a tiny bit, you go from moving all the balls around to moving nothing. That's called a chaos system, and that's called the butterfly effect. The butterfly effect is where a small change can um, grow into a big change. Uh, you could do it in the opposite order. Do it with one angle, and you get no effect on the balls. Do it at a slightly different angle, you get a gigantic effect on the balls. There are certain systems that magnify the amount of energy you put in and make it a much bigger effect. Those are called chaos systems because you can't predict what they will do. Not because they're indeterministic, they're perfectly deterministic, perfectly mechanical. Everything's perfectly, exactly, precisely caused to happen the way it happens. But you can't predict what they're going to do because when you set up a prediction, let's say you have a model, a computer model of what's going on. Let's imagine the computer model is accurate. They aren't really, but imagine it is. But you've got to put in the input. And the input would be the positions of all the balls on the table and, the, and their masses and the exact angle that you're hitting the, ball, hitting the ball with versus the other possible angle, right? All physical measurements are approximate. They're approximate. They're not exact. So when you feed the, the, the facts into the computer, the computer is working with one set of facts. The real world is working with a different set of facts. It's not the same set of facts. Because what you put in the computer was only approximate. You want the technical reason why it's approximate? Because the real world's um, features are measured in real numbers. And you can't write down a real number because there, there requires an infinity of, of, of digits to do that. <coughs> so you're going to approximate. And once you approximate, the computer is computing what the system will do to the approximate values you gave it. The real world is computing the real values. So of course they're going to be different. It's the kind of system where if you change the input by a little bit, the, imp the change in the input grows gigantically. It's called the butterfly effect because uh, the way the fellow who discovered it, the guy at MIT, put it, from this you see that killing a butterfly in Japan could cause a, a, um, a hurricane off the east coast of America. Of course, if you had not done it, the little change there can, can multiply throughout, the, throughout the, uh, um, the weather patterns. Now, the formal name for this is linear systems and nonlinear systems. Nonlinear systems multiply and are chaotic. Linear systems are not. The swing system is, is, a, is a linear system. The billiard table is a nonlinear system. And uh, scientifically, they have pretty good control over which is which. So there's nothing mysterious here when they talk about chaos theory. It's just two different types of theories. But that has nothing to do with this because it's all physical. Everything with the butterfly effect is purely physical causality. This doesn't involve connections to other realms or uh, 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 non-physical interactions at all. It's a purely physical, uh, completely mechanical phenomenon. So it's really not, not related to, to what's going on here. Yeah, we're together? OK, so now um, I, I want to illustrate this idea to you uh, because it gives, I think, a, a kind of general insight into how the Torah works. Um, 1991, both of my parents died. They died within six months of each other. So I was in Avelis for a year and a half. There is a compendium of the laws of people who lose parents and lose relatives called Pnei Baruch. Well, with all the relevant laws uh, uh, described and explained. Now, he asks this question. Suppose the synagogue that you pray, there are 18 people who are in Avelis, who are in mourning. It is a mitzvah for 
someone is in mourning to lead the prayers. There are 18 prayers per week, because on Shabbos, mourners don't lead the prayers. Now let's say that so each one is going to get one prayer out of the 18 prayers of the week, three prayers a day, six days. You're number one. You can choose whichever one you want. Which would be the best of the 18 prayers for you to lead? I think if you don't know the answer, you would never dream of the right answer. The right answer is, yeah. I think about it ten seconds. Well, you should, I, I'm disappointed. I mean, you should have thought maybe a dam was there's a Torah reading, and so on. But there are two of them. So how would you pick one of them? Okay, the right answer is Ma'ariv Motzei Shabbos, evening prayer Saturday night. Really? I mean, there's no. Chazar is the repetition of the of the Shemone Esrei, with the extra brachos, the extra kadesh, and everything else. No, no reading of the Torah. Myra, Motzei Shabbos. Why would that be? And the answer is this: that the souls of the people who have passed on are being judged during the week, but they're not being judged on Shabbos. So Motzei Shabbos, those souls are going back into a condition of judgment, and if at that moment. And they're going back into a condition of judgment. You can do something for that soul that has maximum effect. Maximum benefit for the soul. Second best is Meyer of the rest of the week because the intensity of the judgment in the nighttime is greater than that in the daytime. So as you slide into night, you're going from less intense judgment to more intense judgment. So again, if you lead the prayers at that time, you're doing something that has a greater effect on the soul. When I read that, I thought to myself, hey, what we do here depends upon what's going on there. That's really where it's coming from. That's really where it's aimed at. So all the explanations, if you live a Torah life, you'll have lower blood pressure, and you'll have a much more greater probability that your marriage will be successful, and uh, you know, you'll develop your, your virtues and so forth and so on. All of that is true. And all of that is relevant, but it isn't ultimate. Ultimately, everything you do depends upon what's going on there and how what you're doing here interacts with it. So then you have to, you have to train yourself to think, if you want to ult- understand ultimately how the world works, what element above I'm expressing or living out or interacting with below. I heard this idea. <laughs> 40 years ago, from Elias Svei, the Khan of the Bracha, and a good convention. And, and he put it this way um, People ask, why is there a mitzvah to honor your parents? And they give the answer Well, look, your parents are special. You're in the world because of your parents. And chances are that they did invest in you and they did love you and care for you, so you owe them. So, simply a question of gratitude. Well, so he said, although there is some truth in that explanation, but ultimately the question is wrong and the answer is wrong because you don't ask, why is there a mitzvah? An answer, because there's some feature of the world. You ask, why is there a feature in the world? And you answer, the feature is in the world because of the mitzvah. The real question that should have been asked is, Why do we reproduce sexually? Why do we have parents? That's the question to ask. And the answer is we have parents because there's a mitzvah called honoring your parents that has to be realized in the world. Sexual reproduction is caused as a part of our natural natural reproductive process because that mitzvah has to be enacted in the world. The mitzvah is primary and the world is secondary. Similarly, he asked, why is it that human maturation takes longer than any other mammal, both in absolute time and relative time, relative to, to lifespan. Why does it take so long? And he said, because <coughs> when the child is totally dependent upon its parents, the parents have maximum credibility in the eyes of the child, and the parent can pass down the tradition, both for Jews and the non-Jews also, the tradition about what God wants from them, that tradition going back ultimately to prophecy, and the prophecy is not repeated in every generation. So they, they can pass this down to, the, to, to their children so the children can be 
educated as to the 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 the, the, uh, the information that God provided mankind with. So again, it's it's not because we are nyatanous apes, the way the 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 popularizers of science like to say it. You know that uh, that the gestation that the maturation takes so long. Uh, you have to ask why we have big brains. And if you give an evolutionary answer, which I think you shouldn't, but if you do, you have to ask, why did evolution work that way? And the ultimate answer is because God wants the world to express certain things that are in God's plan for the world, and that's why the world functions the way it does. So the, the Torah's reality is more fundamental, and the physical reality is less fundamental. Yeah? Um, well, I was just thinking, Give over more quantity, and in terms of the ego, we talked about how. how it's give over more quantity of what? Care and love, and and, 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 it, and it means less ego. It means it means having to give oh. more, which is which is a quality of godliness. Oh, I see. For them, for the parents. For the parents, it's a mitzvah for the parents. Uh -huh. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, I suppose that could be. Yeah. Uh, I was Okay, yeah. You said that the, the, the prayer you would give is uh, married to Mosei Shabbat, uh, and we also said that the, the strength of the judgment is greater in the night. So it wouldn't it be the other way around, that when there is more judgment, you should, we should actually uh, be more uh, careful in terms of the, what affects in the upper realm? No, it's the it's the the fact that you're doing it at a, the point of time where the transition is taking place. The time when they're going from one to the other. That's what, and I, I'm not saying this as if it were an obvious piece of logic. I'm saying that the tra the tradition teaches us that that's the time that has the maximum effect. But my own, my own point was only that when you ask why something is done. If you take a mitzvah and, and explain in terms of the effects it has on your life in this world, which means the effect of your, on your life, which doesn't take into account Torah values or Torah pro propositions or whatever, long-lasting marriage is something that everybody wants, lower blood pressure everybody wants, and so forth and so on. So then you're not getting information about the ultimate reason for it, because the ultimate reason for it is, is because of what the Torah created in the world or what the Torah wants from it. Okay, that's one thing. Now, Michal says, um, in, pa in paragraph uh, seven, he says, since the highest wisdom decreed the existence of good and evil, as we mentioned, hmm, as we mentioned, where did we mention that? I didn't make a big deal out of it, but anybody remember? Where did we mention that the highest wisdom decreed the existence of good and evil, particular evil? Where did it do that? Okay, way back, yeah. When it was talking about Okay, so first of all, the, the two motivations that we have to have in order to have free will are the motivation for good and the motivation for evil. Motivation to do evil. That's evil. <laughs> the motivation to do evil is self evil. Secondly, and he said, good comes in two categories and evil comes in two categories. I don't know if you remember, but, but he said, good is intellect and good character traits. Evil is physicality and bad character traits. And God created the physical. He made it the physical. So that's a category of evil, and he created it. So now we're faced with the question, 
or the, 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 the absolute statement that God creates evil. And he quotes the verse. I will recite it for you. It may sound a little strange because you're used to something else. Yotzer or uvorei choshech, osi shalom uvorei ra. Forms light and creates darkness, makes peace and creates evil. Ah, you'll tell me, I don't remember that. I remember uvorei as a coal. He creates everything. True, you do remember that. That you remember from the sitter. But the sitter doesn't bring the verse as it's written in the book of Isaiah. The sitter changes the verse. It says, e- all. In the book of Isaiah, it says, ra. God creates evil. Well, I guess, you know. Now, could you twist out of it and say, it doesn't really mean evil, it means relative evil, only on Sundays it's evil, and on Mondays it's good. You know, you can, you can twist around. But if you start with what the words say, it says that he creates evil. And there's a Mishnah in Brachos that says, when something good happens to you, you make this blessing. And when something bad happens to you, you make that blessing. Which means not only is there good and evil in the world, but we can tell the difference. Because we're supposed to react to them in two different ways. So at the very least, you have to face this problem, not just wave it away. The problem, of course, is if God is good and perfect and all good, how could he make evil? That's the obvious problem. Okay. Now, let's put some more fat on the fire. <clears throat> There's a, uh, one of the great sages and, sa- and saints of the, of the Talmud was named Nochum, and he's called by his nickname Nochum Ish Gamzu because there was a certain circumstance under which he coined the phrase Gamzu Latova which means this too is for good. What happened was he was, uh, a poor person appealed to him for food and he had his animals laden with all of his, with all of his wares and he said, I'll be happy to give you some food as soon as I take the, the material off the donkeys and while he was unloading the donkeys, the person died. So he said, my hands that had no pity and your hands should be cut, chopped off. And my legs that had no pity on your legs should be crippled. And my body should be filled with, my body should be filled with boils. And I should go blind. He cursed himself in various ways. And the curses all came true. And each time one of the curses came true, he said, Gamzu Latova. This too is for good. Which definitely sounds like he's denying the existence of evil. Unless you're paying very close attention. It sounds like that. And Rabbi Kiva was his student. And Rabbi Kiva was on a trip, and he came to a town. They didn't give him hospitality, so he had to lodge that night in the forest. And while he was in the forest, his candle, which was his only source of light and fire, blew out. And the chicken that he had with him, which he used to wake up in the morning, flew off. And his donkey, which was carrying his burdens, chewed through its tether tether and wandered off. And uh, every time, each time that happened, uh, he said, everything that God does is for good. In the morning, he went into the town and found that robbers had been there and they'd slaughtered the town and, and destroyed the town. And he saw that had he had the candle, the robbers would have seen the light. And had he had the chicken, it would have, would have uh, crowed and it would have attracted the, the, the robbers. And had the, the, um, had the donkey been there, then the noise of the donkey would have attracted the... The, the robbers, and he said, everything God does is for good. So now it sounds like not only are we confronted with the idea that God is all good, perfect good, and therefore we can't understand how he does evil, but we have two statements in the Talmud which say that there is no evil. So on the other hand, I have a verse in Isaiah and a Mishnah that says that he does create evil. Let's get the, the idea across. Now, if you pay more careful attention to the statements in the Talmud, you'll see that not only do they oppose what I'm saying, but they support what I'm saying. Let's take Nachuk Mish Gamzu. Gam zu le tova. This too is for good. Hmm. The four in Hebrew is one letter. Just one letter, a What What is this too is for good mean? 
if you thought he was trying to deny the existence of evil, he should have said this too is good. Is good. That is for good. To say it's for good implies that it isn't good. You want to know why it exists? I'll tell you why. I understand why you're bothered by it, because it is indeed a loss, damage, destruction, and so forth and so on, painful, and so forth and so on. But let me tell you something. It's for good. It will lead to good. That's its justification. If it really were good, you shouldn't justify it in the fact that six years from now it will have some good effect. You're saying, making a mistake. Look, more care. it is good right now. And the nafkamina will be this. If you think that it is good, then the more the better. The more the better. If you think that it is good, then you should have it in the world to come also. It's good. The world to come has everything that's good. But if you think it's only for good, if you think it only is to bring good as a consequence, then you could say, well, maybe this is what we could call a necessary evil. It really is an evil, but it's necessary for some good outcome. And that being the case, it's justified, but that doesn't make it good. Maybe that's what the mission is talking about. Maybe that's what Isaiah is talking about. Yes, we will deny absolute evil, evil that has no good payoff. But that's not the same as denying all evil. <coughs> now, let me give you an analogy, and then I'll face a, con a, a, a contradiction, and I'll show you how to solve the contradiction. Let's imagine, you don't know about this because you live in, a, in that sense of more fortunate age, but when I was young, about 103 years ago, um, to give inoculations against various diseases, you got injections with uh, big, thick needles, extremely painful injections. And you got them when you were four and five and six. Um, and usually you didn't go to the doctor by yourself, that you went with your parents so they could hold you down. It was very uncomfortable, very uncomfortable. Now, let's analyze the doctor who gives these injections. I wonder, maybe I should look at him morally as a kind of mixed bag. Yeah, he's inoculating these children and they will be protected against the diseases. But he's also causing pain. So maybe what I should say is, he's partly benevolent, partly oriented to doing good by inoculating them and protecting them from the diseases, but he's also got an evil streak because he's causing them pain. He's doing something that has both good and evil consequences, and uh, he must be a mixed bag morally because he's doing something that's partly good and partly bad. Surely that's wrong, right? I mean, that's, he's perfectly benevolent. He wants to inoculate the children against the diseases, immunize them, and the only way there was to do it was to do it with that needle, which is painful. On balance, it's much better to have the pain of the inoculation and avoid the disease than it is to avoid the pain of the inoculation and have the disease. <coughs> so, someone whose character is perfectly good, someone whose motivations are perfectly good, can do evil. <coughs> Register that. Someone whose character is perfectly good and someone whose motivations are perfectly good can do evil. It can do evil when that evil is the only possible means to be able to accomplish a greater good. Now, the critic will say, okay, Rabbi, you were talking about a doctor. A doctor is human. A doctor has, has limitations. But God is all-powerful. So you can't use this to explain why God would create evil because God, being all-powerful, could get to the good end without using the evil means. And that's always the case with a means-to-ends relationship, where you justify the means on the ground that it produces the ends. If you discover a way to get to the end without the means, you will do that. The person wants to learn all day. But he has a family. He has a supportive family. Right? He inherits $10 million. Now he can learn all day because he can support his family without, uh, without, without working. And now he can learn all day. So the working was only a means to support his family. Now the support came from someplace else. He doesn't use, he doesn't use the means. And if he continues to use the means, he's derelict. He's doing the wrong thing. So how could you say of God that he creates evil because it's a necessary means to a good end 
For God, it can't be necessary, being all-powerful, he's obviously able to get to the end without the means. Okay? That's the objection. But the objection is wrong. The objection is wrong. You can't always get to the end without the means. And even though God is all-powerful, there are times when the end and means are related in a certain way um, where we don't even say of God that he can get to the end without the means. Let me give you simple, paper-thin examples, and then I'll show you how it applies here. Um, of course, you know that every triangle is also a trilateral. To have three angles, you have to have three straight, three straight sides in a closed plane figure, right? Yeah. <laughs> Listen, Rabbi, you're talking about people. Only people can make a triangle. Only people need three straight lines to make a triangle. But God? God can do whatever he wants. He can make a triangle with no lines. He can make a triangle with circles. He can make a triangle out of marshmallows. You can't put any limitations on God. Well, excuse me, if it doesn't have three straight lines, it won't be a triangle. Period. Because that's what a triangle is. A triangle is three straight lines in a closed plane figure. So, by definition, that's what a triangle is. And whatever God can do, if it isn't three straight lines joined in a plane, whatever it is, it won't be a triangle. Even God isn't described as doing something that violates the fundamental laws of logic or the fundamental definition of concepts. All our sages agree on oh, that's what I said. All our sages agree on this. Maimonides writes about it explicitly, the mountain writes about it explicitly, others write, they all agree on this. Now the question is why? Why should we accept this seeming limitation on God? God can do lots and lots and lots of things, but certain things we don't say God can do. And by the way, notice my vocabulary. We don't say God can do them. I didn't say we say he can't do them. If that sounds the same to you, it's not the same, as I'll show you. They're quite different. And all I said was, we don't say that God can do them. So let's go through it piece by piece. First of all, let me try to soften up your intuition. What are you talking about, Rabbi? God's all-powerful. Don't give me limitations. I don't believe in that. If anything you mention, God, God certainly can do it. Really? Let's try this example. Can God learn something new? You can. I can. We do it all the time. It's a genuine ability. No paradox in the idea of learning something new. Can God learn something new? Can God improve? Ability to improve is a genuine ability. Everyone in this room has it. Does God have that ability? I hope you're feeling uncomfortable. Let's see now. If I said that God could learn something new, I would be saying that up until then there was something he didn't know, right? That's what makes it new. To learn something new means up until then you didn't know it. But if God is omniscient, if he knows everything, there's no room to learn something new. How about improve? Well, if God is perfect, perfect means than which there can be no better. So something perfect can't be made better. That's what perfection means. So if he's perfect, then that rules out the ability to improve. What you're supposed to learn from these examples is that certain abilities are based on imperfection. Certain abilities are had only by things that are imperfect. Since our commitment to God is perfection, we're not going to associate with God abilities that imply imperfection. The idea of God's being all-powerful is that he shouldn't lack something that a perfect being should have. Shouldn't run out of energy, shouldn't run out of intelligence, shouldn't run out of resources or imagination. He shouldn't lack something that a perfect being should have. Shouldn't be missing something, failing at something. The ability to learn something new that ability is a failure because it implies you don't already know everything. The ability to improve is already a failure because it means you're not perfect. 
those abilities we don't associate with God. So the naive thought, sure God can do everything. You can't put limitations on God and so forth and so on, is a mistake. That idea is a mistake. Now, hopefully I've jogged your intuitions and opened your minds, opened your minds a little bit. Now, what we're dealing with is a little different, and I'll explain to you why it's different, and I'll stop and we'll, we can discuss it today and tomorrow. Let's go back to triangle, the trilateral, or square circle, which is another one that, that some people use. We don't say that God can make a square circle. Why not? Now, Maimonides gives an answer that I don't understand, so I'm not going to try to explain it to you. I'm going to give you a modern answer. If you're skeptical about the idea, the modern answer should, uh, should uh, be satisfactory. The reason we don't say that God can make a square circle is because the phrase square circle is meaningless. It's meaningless. It has no content. It doesn't describe anything. It doesn't describe even a possibility. It's just gobbledygook. I would say, I would refuse to say that God can make a square circle in the same spirit that I would refuse to say that God can blah. And when you ask, well, what do you mean, blah, Rabbi? I say, you heard me. You heard the sound. Tell me. Do you say God can blah? You're pious, aren't you? You believe God can do everything? You've got to say he can blah. No, I don't, because saying blah is saying nothing. You can't require me to speak meaninglessly. You can't require me to say things that have no sense. Why should I say them? You know, I can just scream, you know, or, or pound a drum. <laughs> We're trying to describe something in correct terms here, right? So the reason I don't say God can, uh, could make a square circle is because when I'm talking, I have a responsibility to make sense, and square circle doesn't make sense, so it's my failure, not his failure, not a weakness in him. It's my failure to talk sense. Let me illustrate this to you with, in a way that maybe will make it uh, intuitive. You're on your way to the mall. You get a call from a friend, you're going to the mall? Yes. Have you got a spare $25? You say, yes. I want you to pick up something for me. If you have time, you have a few minutes. Tell me what you want. He says, please pick up for me a square circle. What would you do? Would you say, oh, I don't have enough money for that. Or, uh, I think what you would say is, what? Pick up for you a what? Where would you look? In the supermarket? In the hardware store? I mean, where, where would you go looking for a square circle? probably the psychiatrist. <laughs> I think what you would say is, I don't understand you. If you could explain to me in other words what you want, I'd be happy to help you, but if all you're going to give me is square circle, it just doesn't go anywhere. Because you say the words, but under my cranium, nothing lights up. You know, there's nothing going on in there when you say square circle. If somebody asks me, can God make a square circle? My response is, I'm sorry, I don't understand your question. It's not correct to say yes. It's not correct to say no. The response is, I understand your question because you used words which to me are meaningless words. So I, I can't, I, I just can't deal with it. I don't know what to, I don't, you know, there's no way for me to, to answer it. It's not a question. So if there's a case where someone's asking, why doesn't God do X? When you analyze X carefully, you see his X has in it a contradiction. At that point, you say, I'm sorry, I don't, I don't regard the question as a legitimate question. And you're not required to answer. So, if I say, and I'm going to spell this out tomorrow in terms of the terms that the Ramchal has been using up until now. If I say, here's a means, here's an end. God creates the means in order to get to the end. Even though the means is evil, he does it because he wants to get to the good end. And the critic says, but you're talking about God. Why doesn't God just create the end all by itself? If I can answer, listen, this description, this end without its means, is a contradiction. It's a square circle. So your question is not a question. You're not raising an alternate possibility and querying why God doesn't do it that way, because there's no that way. The, way the, the words that you're using don't describe a that way to be considered. And that's exactly what the Ramachal is doing here. He's talking about an evil. <coughs> we went through chapter 2. We'll go back to chapter 2, and you'll see that he really took care of this in chapter 2 that the evil that he's talking about is a logically necessary means to the end. The description of the, the end without the means is like square circle, and that being the case, you can't ask why God doesn't do that. There is no that. 
Okay, questions up to here, and, uh, and then tomorrow I'll do it in, in more detail. Yeah. Well, I wanted to talk about, just quickly, it's, it's not a question if you don't mind. Um, it, it's another, like, fall, tell me if I'm right or wrong. But Yotzer, uh, Yotzer is a choshech resa kol, no, sorry. Yotzer or rechoshech. Yotzer or rechoshech. The wording there is Yotzer uvore. Vore, if I remember correctly, in Bereshit, um, it refers to the initial um, creation of all matter, and then Yotzer refers to forming that matter into the in the seven days of creation, um, or, the, or the six days of creation. Okay. And then after each day, he says it was it, that it's good, meaning all the formations that he created were good, and the initial um, the initial. <coughs> Bore, uh, the actual creation, not the formation, was chaotic, both good and bad mixed together. And hey, well, well, what does this got to do with what we're talking about? Well, I, how, so, how would sorry, so so what I'm saying is, so any deficiency, he didn't create. He he just didn't form it. He he the, the initial creation was the only thing. Asma, but if he forms it, you know, if you want to know why there are flowers. And why there are carnivorous animals, which there weren't in Gan Eden, you know, and why there are, are mosquitoes, you have to trace it back to him, even if you call it formation. They wouldn't exist if he hadn't formed them. Yeah. That's not, that's not going to help. Yeah. Um, just briefly touching on one, what you were saying, does creation show a limitation? Oh, we talked about this. You weren't here. Uh, okay. No, it doesn't. Because in, on the contrary, creation is necessary because good is only perfect when it is actualized, not just a potential, not just a capacity, but actualized. And goodness is providing goodness to another, and therefore you have, it has to create in order to be able to, to provide good for another. So it follows from perfection that there's going to be a creation. Without a creation, there would, be, there, there, there would not be perfection. That's right, it has to manifest. I was saying in relation to Hashem had something didn't have something and now we had. Okay, so that, that question was asked also. Did you say, okay, so if, if perfection needs to express itself in terms of giving good to a, crea to a creature, right, what about before the creation? Was it before the creation that God was perfect? It wasn't perfect? At that time, there wasn't anything for him to give the, 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 the good to. But of course, as you probably remember, the words before the creation are square circle also. <clears throat> because Time is part of the creation. There's no time extern external to the creation. And by the way, those who big, believe in the Big Bang Theory say exactly the same thing. Stephen Hawking said, to ask what happened before the Big Bang is like asking, what is there five miles due north of the North Pole? You see, when you stand at the North Pole, everywhere you go is south. Everywhere you go from the North Pole is south. So north of the North Pole is just an, an absolute contradiction. North Pole means the northernmost point. <clears throat> from there, you can't go further north. Time is a feature of the world. There was, so you can't speak about something before the world. So, so that being the case, that's why the, some of the medievals raised that question. They raised it in a very, I would say, stark form. Before the world, all instances of time were, were identical. So how did God choose this instant to create the world rather than another instant? If they're all identical, there couldn't be any reason. That would mean he did something arbitrary, and we understand that God is not arbitrary. So how, how do you explain that? The answer is the question doesn't arise because before the creation isn't, isn't uh, meaningful. Uh, uh, that did answer part of the question, but what I was saying was that God can't learn something new because that's an element of imperfection and stuff like that. But the, the idea of God didn't have time or, or the world, meaning that added to his existence, so to speak. How was, didn't that show, meaning if the world was created, right? that means there was no, there wasn't that thing called the world before that. And I know no, no. Oh, because you're still... Because the word time. before that isn't meaningful. It's uh end run. Yeah. Um, 
the world has to exist in the sense that um, to express God's goodness, it has to exist. Yes. Now, strictly speaking, if you look, read other books of the Ramchal, what you would learn is that there are various levels on which we talk about God. And, and it's a good question. Uh, and the ultimate level is something called Atzmuso, his very essence, about which we say nothing at all. One step below that is there's something called rotzo, will. It's the will that's absolutely good. Not the essence behind it, because to say it's good would be to talk about it. So we don't talk about it at all. Below the essence, there's will. The will is absolute good, and therefore the will has to, has to, has to develop into things to which good can be done. Right? But now the very concept of, I'm saying deep things here, my, my mind says the same thing almost word for word. The word will is detached from the essence. Will means it doesn't flow from the essence. It's not necessitated by the essence, because if so, no decision would be made. So will, the word will puts a block and says, this isn't a necessary flow from the essence. So in that sense, because it depends upon will, it's only as necessary as the will is. And that's not the same as, as its essence, as God's essence. That's, uh, it's, a, it's a deep thing which I haven't completely finished. Okay, tomorrow, I'll go back to the same thing briefly, and we should discuss it till you perhaps become assimilated to the idea that God could create evil. It's a very, very important concept.